number for Oropuch East. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute in this very important debate on the budget and indeed matters related to several sectors. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, the Honorable Minister of Works and Transport did not trouble me too much. So I really don't, don't want to spend too much time on some of those issues he raised. But just to note that the minister appears extremely excited with some of his policies and plans and programs and so on. And he's obviously passionate about that sector. It is a pity that we, ha we have these type of announcements eight years into the administration and on the verge of the mitten office that they come today to tell us about drainage, roads, bridges. You would not believe that this is an administration that has been there eight years and done nothing, precious little. And today would tell us about these plans. The minister told us about that highway to Point Fortin as part of a project in 1967. That was started by the, the administration of the People's Partnership led by the member for Separia. That is our project. The minister, the minister has gone every two, three years, not necessarily this minister, but a minister of works and transport, to cut a ribbon to open half a mile, quarter mile. This minister will be remembered as the minister who presided over, as my friend from Toko, Sandy Grandi, reminded us, one lane international highways. <laughs> and while I am happy as a southerner to hear of this highway to Point Fortin, 20 minutes I'm told it will take to Point Fortin to visit my friend from Point Fortin down there. But the minister in, is 55 minutes and I wish he had more time, honestly. I wish the minister had more time. Because to this day the minister had, has not told us how you will reach in 20 minutes passing through the mosquito crack. Because that is not fixed. A year and a half later, we have no report. We are told $64 million more because they built a piece of the highway at the Mosquito Creek around there. And it, Madam Speaker, it broke up like Crick's biscuit on your plate. And that is what we face. So we can't go 20 minutes uh, to point 14, I'm afraid, if we have to pass through the mosquito crack. The minister told us about drainage and bridges and so on, but minister, I want to alert you. You and my friends on the other side are an opposition in waiting. Yeah. You are in the departure lounge. And we want to check your luggage before you leave. <laughs> they are in the departure lounge, 20 months or so left. So nobody will believe any plans and programs. Nobody will accept it. Madam Speaker, today we heard from the minister there telling us, you know, about climate change and so on. The Manzanella Road breaking up since 1973. We hear about climate change today. Madam Speaker, we heard about all the grand plans in Sandy Grandi. Everything the minister touched, he says, that is a nightmare. This is a nightmare. That is a nightmare. Eight years is a nightmare of the PNL. Eight years they have been there. So, as I said, I don't want to get too carried away. The minister told us that what we will be resembling India by land use and so on soon. I tell him, <laughs> India just put a rocket on the moon, you couldn't land a plane in Tobago. <laughs> but we would be like India and so on, you know. The minister is clearly passionate and excited by that sector. And in the year, in the 22 months from now, I am sure he will avail himself of some employment opportunity around the sector when the United National Gov uh, Congress forms the government of Toronto. Because he, he may have some talent that we don't know about. Madam Speaker, yeah, because when you look around opposite, I don't know what they'll be doing in 20 months from now, you know. Half of them are unemployable, the next half untrainable. So I don't know what they will be doing. Madam Speaker, let me get to the point immediately. Madam Speaker, no one listening to this debate would believe the state of the country we are in. No one would believe that on this day when I stand to speak in this debate, this morning was an assassination attempt 
on a deputy commissioner of prisons in Trinidad and Tobago. I'm finished with you, you can go. Yeah, Madam Speaker, <laughs> Madam Speaker, no one will believe that there was an attempt on the life, on the life of a deputy commissioner of prisons. Today we extend very deep concern for Mr. Steve Phelps, prison officer, who was shot this morning at 7 a.m. or around there in an attempt to assassinate a deputy commissioner of prisons. This is where this country has reached, Madam Speaker. We have heard from the prison officers suggesting that it is a matter of hours before prison officers may walk out of the prison and go home and abandon their post. And the Prime Minister, the Minister of National Security, in the last eight hours or so, have said nothing about this. That is a very scary development in a country when you have an attempt to assassinate such an office holder. Madam Speaker, this speaks to the collapse of the intelligence agencies. They have collapsed. You know, they know when the UNC holding a protest over the flyover of Monroe Road. They know when we protest in Debe Junction, but they don't have intelligence as to who is going to assassinate, attempt to kill a deputy commissioner. Of police. The entire intelligence agency should be fired forthwith. That you cannot intervene, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the political leader of this side, the government in waiting, Madam Speaker, gave a brilliant and comprehensive, detailed analysis of our problems, sector by sector, last Friday. We want to join uh, our voices together and congratulate her on that presentation. But Madam Speaker, when I heard her, I sat here and I was frightened, I was nervous, I was anxious. I couldn't believe there's so much work we have to go and do again. And a lot of that work will fall on the slender and not so slender shoulders <laughs> of my colleagues on this side. But we will have to work hard to save this country. It will not be easy. Madam Speaker, if you could tell me one thing they have built, I will tell you one thing that they have not destroyed. <laughs> they have destroyed every sector, every sector. We will have to rebuild to save this country, Madam Speaker. And in the budget, the budget brought no hope. And to hear my colleagues opposite speak on this budget, the member for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, will eventually try to convince people who are unemployed that they are really not unemployed, eh? they're employed. That's where he is going eventually. The members opposite speaking, you know, with such fanfare about development and so on. The member for St. Joseph presiding over a, a, a particular sector, Madam Speaker, constituent of mine, went to the San Fernando General Hospital a few days ago, I don't want to be too specific, needing emergency dialysis. Do you know emergency dialysis was not available at the San Fernando General Hospital? The constituent passed away. Now, I'm not saying that if the constituent necessarily got that, it would have changed anything, but emergency, that is, that is a human resource challenge, not, a, not an equipment challenge, I'm told. It is managing the human resource of the health sector to provide that. Madam Speaker, in Mount Hope, uh, the relatives of patients tell me they buy toilet seats to go in the ward to put for male toilet, female toilet, and so on. They go with, it's called Lasco fan. Yes. They go with Lasco fans and so on when they have a loved one in a ward so they can get some breeze. That is the health sector. So I want to tell the Minister of Health that my constituent died. But the good news is that when they took her, they got a good park in space at the brand new car park mm. for $152 million. Yes. And that really sums up the problem, you know. That sums up the problem. $260 million to build an administrative building for the staff of the Ministry of Health and a patient died because you couldn't do emergency dialysis. And that is where we are, Madam Speaker. I say no about that. No more about that. Madam Speaker, I was making the point that the, the attempt today on the uh, Deputy Commissioner's life, prisons, suggests that intelligence has collapsed. Madam Speaker, it is not only in that area. Madam Speaker, a few days ago, on or around October 4th, I have in my hand an intelligence brief from the Toronto Tobago Police Service. 
Port of Spain gang and Intel unit, and I will read only a few lines, and I will call absolutely no name and that type of thing. But Madam Speaker, in this brief, the police is warning the police. They are warning themselves. And, and they said a gang has declared war, a particular gang, on members of the Toronto Tobago Police Service. Threats came in in response to a particular activity that took place. And a member of the gang was, was recorded as saying, knock it upon them, police them. I don't know how to pronounce that, but that is what the message is. Tension is rising in this society, Madam Speaker. Tension is rising when the police are now telling the police, be careful, be on high alert, be cautious, remain vigilant. That is police to, to police. If that is the state of where we have reached, then the government of Trinidad and Tobago has indeed collapsed. And you cannot expect, Madam Speaker, Trinidad and Tobago police officers and prison officers to work in this environment. Today, I want to tell the prison officers and the Trinidad and Tobago members of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, I want to tell them that the United National Congress stands with them. And we will provide you with the equipment, with the resources, with the legislative framework, so that you can work and be assured that you have some measure of safety. The Honorable Member for Separia, Madam Speaker, will provide the resources, will provide the legal framework to support the police and the prison officers and law enforcement officers. Madam Speaker, we have said to the police, and today we say to the police of, uh, prison officers, stand your ground because we will stand our ground. And this administration is on the way out, Mr. Deputy Speaker. You see, the people are the final arbiters in all matters of politics. It is always the people. At the end of the day, you can talk how much you want. The people are the final arbiters. And August 14th was a litmus test. That was a litmus test. It is a small test like a, in, in a lab as to what we are likely to see, what is happening. And the United National Congress got the overwhelming majority of votes in Trinidad. Mere months after they were decimated in Tobago. So as a former cabinet colleague of mine said, they lost Tobago, they lost Trinidad, they are holding on to the and. <laughs> Trinidad and Tobago. And they will lose that too. Madam, uh, Mr. De uh, De Deputy Speaker, they have no support and today they are a minority government with no moral authority. This is why gunmen could shoot at the Deputy Commissioner of Police vehicle and in Deputy um, Prisoner, uh, Commissioner of Prisons and injure his bodyguard or driver, as the case may be, because the government itself, they believe, cannot confront the criminal elements. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, I repeat the call that the Minister of National Security ought to go. He ought to go promptly. Mr. Deputy Speaker, he is now legendary. He is now legendary in this land as the worst performing Minister of National Security in the history of the sector. Mr. Deputy Speaker, he has, he, he has surpassed all failure standards. All. He has surpassed them. Just when we believe it cannot get worse, he was forced by some angel of some kind to apologize in, in a left-handed way. I, I, I read it and didn't understand it, what he was saying really, but that again is typical of him. So we could not understand the apology. But this is not a matter of apology, as the Guardian editorial today pointed out. That will not help. Policy will help. Program will help. Resources will help. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I don't have to remind you, the member for Lavantel West presides over the fire services. Now, I want to tell the people of Toronto Tobago, anytime you think security, you must think safety. They go together. There's an emergency on the highway. There's a killing, a murder. You ever notice it's police and ambulance and fire? Because security go with safety. In Trinidad and Tobago today, let me tell you in case you don't know, 11 stations, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, four out of 11 have fire, ambula, uh, fire appliances. Four out of 11. No appliances in Belmont, Woodbrook, Santa Cruz, Tanapuna Station. Do you know if there's a road traffic accident and an appliance leave from Sour to go somewhere down the highway, and in that business spread in Sour Barataria, my great friend next to me here, 
that a fire appliance has to come from Port of Spain? Not in Mayaro, not in Pinal. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and he presides over that. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I had a figure that I'm told. $2.5 million to outfit a fire appliance because it's a very specialized kind of vehicle and with all kind of detailed equipment and so on. You could not find that to purchase more appliances for Pinal, for Siparia, for Woodbrook, for Sawa, for places. But you find $260 million to build a headquarters to the Ministry, Ministry of Health. $132 million to build a car park. But you cannot provide a fire appliance in an area to save lives. What kind of government is this? What kind of government, Mr. Deputy Speaker? Mr. Deputy Speaker, the fire personnel has told us they lack proper gloves, breeder, what's called breeder apparatus, turn out jacket suits, as in suits they put uh, both up and down when you're going into fire and you're going into the heat and so on. They lack sufficient uh, equipment. Not everybody have a, um, the, the jackets. In fact, they were telling me that they don't even have the ax that you could use to, to break down a door. And I told them, well, you should ask the Minister of National Security. You cannot buy basic equipment, but you spend hundreds of millions of dollars in, in, in matters that are not priority. I am not saying we shouldn't have good car park for people. I am not saying the public servants shouldn't be in nice, comfortable headquarters and so on. We outfitted the government campus, $1 billion for ministries of government, the partnership. Nobody raised any corruption about that, I notice. I'll tell you why on our next occasion. Mr. Deputy Speaker, so nothing at Pinal. I don't know if it's because the minister from Port of Spain, St. Andrews, had a terrible fall there. Nothing there, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In terms of police, are you aware that there are 600 police vehicles that are not roadworthy and cannot be used? 600 police vehicles cannot be used at this time. They're in a graveyard somewhere in Komoto, I'm, I'm told. That is the state of, of play in terms of that, Mr. Deputy Speaker. That is the say, body cameras, and I just want to go quickly. Body cameras, they don't have enough or sufficient. There's a handheld device called an electronic U-turn -turn device. It is used to get data quickly. When you stop somebody on the highway and you, you feel they're suspicious, you want to check, um, uh, quickly check their driver's permit to see if they have the merit points, to see if they are red flagged and so on. It is something called an electronic U-turn device. Okay, we don't have that. We don't have that and we don't have sufficient quantities. So the policemen cannot do that on the road. And this happens under the member for Love Until West. Madam, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, these are the issues that confront us. These are the issues. And they come in this debate and this budget, you know, with, with all type of hoax and so on, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The one that the classic one the Minister of Finance gave us is the school book and, and what? Uniform grant? Yeah. The terms start already last month. They come with this grant now. And you have to do a means test, so that means it's not automatic. So in the meanwhile, you have to stay home. So in the meanwhile, you stay home. <laughs> you have no book, you have no uniform. So when are you going to give this grant to the parents and so on? For the next term, that is next year, uh, next no, year, <laughs> next year, September. Because presumably you don't, buy, you don't change books every term. No. It's every year. Look at that. Nobody pick up that and everybody say book grant on the other side. They pong the desk. I think one of them bro broke down a desk somewhere there. Ponging when they hear school grant. School term open. Go on. But they hear that and, they, and they're happy and they excite themselves. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this country today overridden with crime. Overridden. Bandits would go into a health center and rob patients. They would rob the chicken and chips man. I am predicting if this thing continue for Christmas, people will invade homes to steal Christmas gifts from under the trees. That is where it will reach. They, when they leave in now and they ambush you at home, you'll be going with the gifts from under the Christmas tree. That is where Trinidad and Tobago has reached and they are now happy and clapping and, oh, we are doing so well, we are doing so well, Mr. Deputy Speaker. They are robbing churches, mandirs, mosques today, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and the government pat themselves on the back and say we are doing a good job. We are doing a good job. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to get on to another important matter which will engage my attention for a minute. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I was just reflecting, as I said before, 
the member for uh, the Minister of Works and Transport really didn't give us much by way of to um, respond to. But I'm hoping the Minister of, uh, of Housing can speak in this debate at some time and in the, clear up some matters for us. M Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are proud that when we held that position of government, 2010-2015, under the HDC and the Ministry of Housing, which I had the honor to lead, we gave out 100 homes a week. 100 homes per week. When they get in office, they fire everybody who was doing that. And I think they charge a few too. Not charge, they put them in civil court matters yeah. and so on. Uh, 100 homes per week given out. They come today, the minister, and they boast in one year they gave out 475 housing units. In one year. I see boast in a, That would have been how much? A month and a half for us or something? We'd have done that in a month and a half. 100 homes per week. 7,000 or so over the period. I mean, people whisper to me in my ear, we can't wait for you all to come back and waiting for my house. Then I get more nervous. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, that housing sector is now in shambles, in a mess. And it is not only that they took the wrong approach, everywhere they met successful contra um, contractors and so on, they put them in court to tie them up for money. And then stop all the projects. They stop all the projects, put people in civil court over money issues, so nothing is built, nothing is done. Eight years later, there are housing sites in this country abandoned, abandoned. Mr. Deputy Speaker, something has come to my attention. I want to raise it in this house because I think it's really worthy of being raised. But before I get to that, there's a release dated October 10, 2023 on the HDC website that was properly smoked out by the member for Barataria, Samoa. Nothing missed that eye of his. And it says remedial works to begin at Shafford Court. Mr. Speaker, Shafford Court is located in Port of Spain. It's an HDC compound. Mr. Deputy Speaker, would you believe concrete fall off the building? Concrete fall from the building and drop on four vehicles? <laughs> they, they erected housing structures in Port of Spain and the concrete fall down, not on one vehicle, no, on four. That could have injured, killed human beings. This is the type of construction. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, when I read that, I understood well what was happening. I understood well. Because you see, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have in my hand a report, uh, a big report. <laughs> Phase two design development report on houses. Now this is of a, a particular, um, what you call housing estate in um, Dabadi. It is called Trash Trail. I remembered it well, because Mr. Deputy Speaker, under my ministry, when I had the honor there, we purchased the lands there for housing, for about a thousand housing units and so on. We did the purchase. I noticed nobody's saying, um, I have to answer questions for that. Because and again, I'll tell you why I don't have to answer questions for that. And, I may, and they say I have to answer for somebody else or something else. And I want to tell the member for Diego Martin West in his absence, I'll speak today as a functionary. <laughs> so, as a functionary, I speak to indicate that we purchased this land. When we left office, we had already turned south, already had uh, construction activities started by about four or five contractors. They stop it. They stop it because probably they don't like the contractor. Probably they feel the contractor is UNC or something like that. It stopped. But you know, they restarted it in 2017. They restart in 2017 with... I don't know which contractor and which contractor not because I, did not, I wasn't privy to that type of thing, information. But Mr. let me take a sip of water first. <laughs> Is that serious? Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have a report in our hand from a company called CEP. It is a, an engineering report dated 30th August 2022. That project started 2017. That is five years later. So that means in five years nobody built a house there. No house was given out, no, no homes given out and so on. 2022, and Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to take you through this report. It is on Trinidad and Tobago Housing Development Corporation Trash Trail Development Zones, D to E1. But in a nutshell, I can tell you, it deals with about 100 town houses. 100, we have pictures. In fact, I am told that some clever person put up pictures of this on a website called Counterpunch TT. I don't know of the website. It is nothing I know about, but if somebody will punch it in, they could probably see pictures while I talk. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, 
they did an engineering study. They were asked to undertake studies on these 100 townhouses. This is almost, when you look at the price of both infrastructure and the building, $100 million. Las Alturas was about $17 million. The mosquito crack will cost us about $64 million. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you understand where I'm going with this? It's $100 million spent or oh, budgeted for this. We'll have to come to that. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when they look through and they conclude for the various areas, on ter in terms of foundation, they were looking at the soils. The soil, as it presently is, and treated and the development works done, is not capable of withstanding applied loads. You know what I mean? Applied loads? I mean, nobody can go there. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the bearing capacity, I'm reading page 29, the bearing capacity and sat a settlement analysis done suggests that the foundation for some of the townhouse blocks will not be able to suppo support the applied loads. Huh? And therefore, the existing soil conditions will need to be improved to achieve an increased bearing capacity. Where is Mr. Sinanan when you need him? The townhouse blocks that um, will require... Member, member, please remember proper titles. Oh, I was referring to another Sinanan in San Fernando, Barry Sinanan. Okay. The you, townhouse blocks that will require some improvement work below the substructure. Mr. Deputy Speaker, without reading details and technical details, you know what is happening here? They are now telling, the, the consultant is now telling the HDC, they have an option to demolish 100 townhouses or go and inject the soil. It's called oh, Gauten? Grouten. It's called Grouten. We'll have the words coming up just now. I myself had to learn a few things. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the building footprint is underdeveloped for the structure, but the structure is up. So they are now saying, now when I read this, I thought it was the Ministry of Health. I didn't know how in this go injection. They have to go at the side of the building through some complicated scientific process with, I imagine, sophisticated technology to inject the soil. Yeah, they're going to do injections of the soil. That is where we are in this um, housing. Masonry share walls. Mr. Speaker, they speak about that, and I'll, I want to get through some of these things. Reinforced a housing Botox type of business, I'm told. <laughs> Reinforced concrete beams. They talk about that, but they want reinforced concrete first floor slab, page 30. Based on the visual inspection of cord concrete samples through the RC is rein reinforced concrete first floor slab in block 35, the areas where a galvanized sheeting was used, no reinforcing bars were observed. Now, I, no steel. So they put concrete with no steel. So I want to tell people who take in these homes, I hope they don't, they don't like chutney music and things. You know, because if you make two dance there, you're pumping in the sun. <laughs> Literally. Literally. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, no concrete bars were observed. In addition, the alternative galvanized roof sheeting used to support the suspended first floor slab is not a material recommended for that application, and it lacks the material properties for concrete bond to be achieved. The roof sheeting are small and do not have an embossment pattern manufactured into the sides, some of the technical issues. We go on, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to another area, geotechnical design considerations. From the results of our, and it's a very technical report, but I, I'm only dealing with conclusions. From the results of our bearing capacity and settlement analysis, it was determined that the foundation of some of the units will be unable to support the applied loads of the two-story structures. They don't build it already. What? This, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is, speaks to a breach of fiduciary duties of Noel Garcia, Newman George, and all of them at the HDC. And Noel Garcia, wherever he is, he should resign forthwith if he had any, if he had any Silence. part to play in this matter. Let, the member for Port of Spain South wants to hear more. Let me tell him. 
and bear, the bearing no, capacity. Just so, one is second. No. Again, it's clear. Sitting is in session. Let's ensure that we maintain the proper decorum. Right? I only recognize the member for Oropuch East. Member for Naparima, please. Please. Thank you. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this speaks to a breach of fiduciary duties of the board, of the board that they presided over this matter. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is an impending collapse. This is Las Alturas too, for $100 million. I mean, that couldn't happen when the member for San Fernando West sat on the HDC board, not at all. And you know, you cannot give people those homes in these conditions with such a technical review. Nobody will be able to spend one night there. The Prime Minister, you know, always Nobody likes to point say. out about, uh, uh, no, always want to point about nighty and dust and thing. Nobody will put on a nighty and stay there one night. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, I call for an independent inquiry into the collapse of a hundred town units at Crest Trail. And the cost of home? And the cost, at the cost of almost a hundred million dollars. My friend from Lopino Bonner West, his eyes open big. He can't believe it, Mr. Deputy Speaker. He's in awe, in shock. Yes. His mouth agape. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, this calls for an investigation. I want to take you through another piece of this report. Conclusion and recommendations of one part. And they are indicating with some technical um, things and so on. They need to do backfilling now. This is after the unit's built, huh? They need to do backfilling on the land. This happened in Debe Wellington when we came into office in 2010. Same thing. The HDC houses were moving. I thought at one time they were mobile. <laughs> because they didn't, they didn't treat with the cane land well enough with infrastructure, so the houses were moving by two feet every now and then. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it was determined that the foundation of some of the units will be unable to support the applied loads of two-story structures. The bearing capacity was too low. There is need for excavation of the foundation. Now they come to, they're going to dig up the foundation when you already build the building, <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker. And there's something that is called the reinforcing. The ring beam. The ring beam. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I had to learn so much about ring beam and so on. Apparently, ring beams are the beams you put at the top to hold down um, the blocks and then the roof. And you tie the roof to the ring beam. Mm -hmm. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this report is telling you that no ring beams were observed. What? And so they have some details in some of the bedrooms and some of the things. No rebars in, co in concrete. No rebars in concrete. No in the, in the bedrooms of these people. So imagine you get a nice HDC house. You move in there with your spouse or so. Uh, and you lie down on that bed in the night. And whap, the, 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 the roof blow away. The roof. <laughs> yeah. The roof gone. And the bed in the first floor. Yeah. And then your bed fall along on the first floor because the slab, the flooring has no... Iron, iron steel. steel. So this is a, a serious matter, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I am not today casting aspersions on any contractor or group of contractors. The HDC has ultimate responsibility for this. They have a project engineer, a project manager, a department to monitor this. And, a and they have a minister of housing whose job it is to hold the HDC accountable. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have some pictures in the report that people will look at and so on. And, and when they took concrete to test, in fact, they were saying that they took four pieces of concrete to test, three fell apart, so only one they could have used. You know? Only one they could have used in the analysis. And, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they came to another, um, into another area. And they won the famous Las Alturas uh, dilemma. To demolish or not to demolish? That is the question. Mm -hmm. That is where they are. They are now pr making proposals as to whether they should go to those units in Trestrail and demolish completely and rebuild, and then you lose your $100 million, as the case may be, or you go and give injection to the soil and try to hold it up. But it's not just the soil. It is the wall. They are, they are suggesting that, you know, like in a big mall, you run iron across walls and things to hold up frame, big, big frame. They are suggesting you try to do that in some of the houses as well. Instead of breaking it down, you put cross beam and all type of thing to hold up that. Yeah, yeah. So that will look like a German house, I imagine, after, uh, you know, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And they, and they had the goal, unmitigated goal, 
to attack us. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to say with pride and with no fear of contradiction, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to make the point. In the, year, in the years 2010 to 2015, not one police station of the nine, not one house of the 7,000, not one fire station of the four we built, Mr. Deputy Speaker, not one school of the hundred we built, fall down. Nothing the People's Partnership built has collapsed. With, the, with my friends opposite, you have the Baran Lara, we don't want to say too much about that. You have the mosquito crack, you have the Las Alturas, and now you have Las Alturas too. Anytime they build something, these things happen. What is it? What is it about them that everything fall apart around them? And they have fallen apart in the Tobago House of Assembly. They have fallen apart in the local government, and they will fall apart in the general election. So come. They are on the way out, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And we cannot continue this way, Mr. Deputy Speaker, where we have these types of reports coming to us, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And on that note, I have received complaints, many people know I'm a former housing minister, that they were making before the local government elections. They had a lot of functions, giving out keys to people for HDC homes. They call back the people and take back the keys. <laughs> now, I don't know what to say again. I think they should, they should give out um, what is, a computer cards or something. They take back the keys from the people who receive it because they said they have to do um, remedial work on the units. So that was just for the formality and the, um, you know, the show to the public. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, we call for this investigation into the terrestrial housing development and what appears to be $100 million going down the drain. And the report is here. If the report is fake, tell me. If the report is not true, tell me. If, if the technical details that they give here uh, is it, incorrect, no, tell me. Tell me. It is in my hand. And I'm willing to share it. I'm willing to share this report. Mr. Deputy Speaker, so I don't want to continue anymore with housing in that area. But to really come back to an issue that I wanted to raise. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on the matter of crime and insecurity. A matter was raised in the public domain a few um, weeks ago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And we raised the, Madam Speaker, matter was raised in the public domain a few weeks ago. And I want to put on record our very deep concern with this new form of extortion that is perpetrated by alleged members of gangs, where they go to businessmen and, de and demand security money. They demand security money. And if you do not pay, you refuse to pay, there's a fear. There's a fear, Mr. Um, uh, Madam Speaker, that they can attack, they can injure, they can, they can murder your family, members of your family. The front page of The Guardian today, I believe it is, if I am not mistaken. Fear grips bamboo number two. Businessmen report death threats from criminals. Ordered to pay hundreds of thousands for protection. Some flee community, others want lockdown. This is the work of gangs. You know what is amazing? This government spent 45 million plus, it could be much more, to hire lawyers, superintendent, special reserve police, Kate McMahon from London, and her team to come down here to persecute members of the UNC. 45 million plus. She make a mistake, and, and I think she sent my email the bill to. <laughs> she felt that if the PNM not paid, I should pay. <laughs> And Madam, Deputy, Madam Speaker, they spent $45 million plus, but they cannot spend money. They cannot spend money to strengthen the Toronto Tobago Police Service or to seek international help so that we can get uh, some assistance to the police to deal with what is called serious and organized crime that includes gangs. All over the world, there's a threat you know, in different parts of the world. But we need, the time is coming when we may need international help. Because, Madam Speaker, let's be real. The average age of a gang member is 22 years. Policemen and women would like to reach in their 70s to see their children and grandchildren. And they are in fear, some of them. They have to be alert, to be vigilant. They do the best under the circumstances. But you spend $45 million to persecute UNC operatives or functionaries, I don't know. But you, you don't want to spend a cent to get international and foreign help to strengthen the, the gang unit. In, in fact, I want to put on, on record, it is time the police, the TTPS, create an extortion unit to deal with this specific issue 
of extortion. It may involve, Madam Speaker, it may involve amending the last NIAC, because under the last NIAC, the penalty we believe for extortion and, and demanding money by menace, as they call it, and so on, I believe is five years, two to five years. So imagine you are asking businessmen for millions of dollars in quote-unquote security money. If you get catch, it's two to five years. Maximum. Maximum. This requires a stiff penalty, a stiff sentence to send the message. In a society, Madam Speaker, when a business person close down their business and migrate, people lose their jobs. They, nobody pays taxes. There's no um, income redistribution and redistribution. You collapse the economy. You depress the economy when the business community migrate and leave. And businessmen and women are telling you they prefer to go and live abroad than to be here for gang members to be calling them for protection money and security and payments and so on. This is something we have to deal with, Madam Speaker. It may require amending the law, as I said, the last NIAC, and increase the penalty and, and create an offense of extortion by gang members, if it comes to that, Madam, Deputy Spe Madam Speaker. And we call on the police to be more vigilant with this as well. I read a report in the newspaper where a high-ranking officer was saying, um, we have no reports of extortion, you know, <laughs> when we raised it at a Sunday morning press conference. I want to tell my friend, the policeman, <laughs> I tell my friend, my friend, don't expect a businessman to walk into a police station, go to the constable at the desk and say, hello, I am the businessman, my name is XY, and um, a gang member just um, asked me for money. What, what do you, you want to kill him? You cannot do that. This has to be intelligence driven. It has to be a high level of confidentiality and privacy in dealing with that sensitive matters. The police can't expect people to walk in the station and say, I am a businessman, I operate in this hardware, this supermarket, wherever, or I'm a contractor on a construction site, and they're just asking me for money. You're in trouble. Because, you know, we all know the situation in Trinidad and Tobago. Gang members may get that information, and they may take retaliate, uh, retaliation, action against uh, business persons, and so on. So, so Mr. Um, Mr. Madam Speaker, this is an urgent matter that the government needs to address. And as I say, if we don't have the capacity in Trinidad and Tobago, we, have, we may have to look outside to ensure that we have some type of support to matters like these. Madam Speaker, I had a couple matters again um, to raise before Madam Speaker I end. I, I wanted to remind the Minister of Health, Madam Speaker, I, I had the opportunity to listen to the Minister of Health. And the Minister of Health made a statement in the Parliament during his contribution, I believe. And he was talking about making the Port of Spain Hospital a campus of some kind, a, a campus for um, teaching and training and so on. I want to remind the national community, if not the Minister himself, because I'm not sure if he's aware, Mr. Madam Speaker, that it was the United National Congress and the People's Partnership who, uh, that, that government outlined a policy for a new medical campus to the, for the Port of Spain General Hospital. So the minister comes to parliament, you know, and he, he, he speaks about the Port of Spain um, a campus, a medical city, and teaching facilities and so on in his speech. And I have a, a note, new medical campus coming to Port of Spain Hospital. Hear the date on this. December 18, 2013, Trinidad Express. We would have done that, already. that would have finished a long time, long time. Yes. That would have been there already. The British government will assist this country to construct a state-of-the-art medical campus at the Port of Spain General Hospital, says Minister of Health Dr. Fouad Khan. Khan spoke at a post-cabinet uh, press conference and indicated that there was a memorandum of understanding for a proposed medical campus. That's a partnership idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The partnership was going to implement that. Eight years, how much? No, well, not eight years. Ten years. Ten years later, we have a big announcement that a committee is being formed. <laughs> we don't uh, sign the MOU. We sign the MOU, a committee is being formed. That is the announcement that we are like waiting. Advisory committee. advisory committee. That is like an advisory committee, the member for Princess Tong pointed out earlier, <laughs> to deal with some other matters. You know, he pointed out that. Solid some, some matters of waste. <laughs> Mr. Madam Deputy Speaker, the government also announced the recruitment of, um, 
I think it was 1,000 police officers more to the um, police service. You know what was interesting when I heard that um, comment, when I heard that policy being outlined? That at the Joint Select Committee on National Security, we have had on several occasions the opportunity to examine... Member for all Puchis, your original speaking time is now spent. You have 10 more minutes to wind up your you. contribution. You may proceed. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Speaker, when the Commissioner of Police came to several of our meetings, you know, the Commissioner of Police gave us what appeared to us to be a very detailed uh, crime reduction plan dealing with several areas. It was really comprehensive enough for that purpose. And uh, of course, the Commissioner also made available to us a PowerPoint uh, presentation and so on. And we looked at it, we examined that plan. But you know, in that plan, nowhere it speaks about increasing the manpower from 300 intake per year, which is the norm, to 1,000. Where you get this idea from? And how are you going to do 1,000 persons recruited in one year? In one year? This is a matter that the government needs to rethink, particularly where you have SRPs already in the system with considerable experience and so on. You may want to move the SRPs to the mainstream Trying to make a police service as part of your increase in manpower resources to, to undertake specific areas of work, Ma'am, Madam Speaker. So I was taken aback by that um, uh, policy initiative. Madam Speaker, in the few minutes I have left, I wanted to just speak to a couple matters in the constituency of Oro Pooch East. And I wanted to say, again, my gratitude to the people of Oro Pooch East who have returned me and the United National Congress on multiple occasions as their beloved member of parliament. <laughs> Madam Speaker, we again call on the Minister of Education. We will call upon you from now until thy kingdom come. When are you opening the Ramai uh, Trace Hindu School? When? Madam Speaker, every year I ask this question, and typically it is question one on the other paper every year. And then I'll have to ask it again. And it is so bad, Madam Speaker, I do not even have supplemental questions because it is for the record I'm asking. And the minister has promised, and the minister before her, I, I forgot his name, but... Yes, uh, a, dis a distinguished gentleman. Before her, he promised me in writing. He said once to me here, don't worry, it will be opened. For me, I didn't ask him which century. <laughs> and I again plea with the minister, please, it is one thing to punish the member for Arapuchis, but do not pu punish the children of Arapuchis. Those children, do you know children have graduated from a school and never set foot in the school. <laughs> For seven years or so, they were at a temple, a Hindu temple, far away from where the school is located. And when they graduate, they got a certificate that they attended the school, which they never set foot in. That is where it is. And it is because the member of Rapuchis. The prime minister said that he was in London. That question was actually asked in London of him. And that is their approach, but I'm saying don't punish the people. And I'll ask the Minister of Education on, on, a, on a related note, what is the status, what are we doing with the South Campus of the University of the West Indies? The, the, the constituency of Separia in the area of Clark Road and so on was supposed to become an education hub in that area with secondary schools, training facilities and so on. When you pass there now, everything covered in bush. Yes. yes. That is how they have left education for Karayli Vine to run all over. I mean, the, the, the cost of doing that must be very significant as well because they have left it for eight years. So that's a significant cost. But the Minister of Education could give us a statement as to what is happening with that, with those areas. Ms. Uh, Madam, uh, Madam Speaker, what is happening in the constituency of Arupuch there? I mean, I want to raise again because my constituents are glued to their screens. We have serious problems with the road network. I mean, I don't know what else to tell the Minister of Works. This is the only island that, that parts are inaccessible by road. Normally, that's for con uh, continent and so on. You know, there are big countries with forests and so You say, okay, there's a point at which roads stop and you can't go by road. This is an island where there are some places you cannot go by road. In the Papuri Road in my constituency, Madam Speaker, long time you used to dodge the hole, now you cannot dodge anymore. 
You have to deselect which pothole am I going into. <laughs> Let's decide that before. Because you can't dodge anymore. Bridges have collapsed in the constituency. We asked the minister, so a bridge in Sahani Trace, a bridge in Barakpur. They put a temporary type of steel structure and so on. They told me, no, 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 don't worry. Now, anytime the ministers on the other side tell me, don't worry, I worry. I frighten. And he, no, he's saying, he's saying, so Madam, Madam Speaker, these are questions I had for the Minister of Works and Transport. I know his hands are full, given the deplorable state of infrastructure in the country. His hands are full. I don't know, you know, he's excited now that he's demitting office. <laughs> Madam, Deputy, Madam Speaker, but in the constituency, we have problems with education. We have problems with infrastructure. Uh, with, with, oh, water. I mean, I... I don't know what else to say about this, uh, this problem with water in this country. This is, the, this is the only island where one month you could drown in flood and the next month you have no water to drink. It's the only island this could happen. And that is a development gap. Madam Speaker, the, this government has presided over eight years of lost development. It's called lost development in theory. I was recently abroad and a gentleman met me, elderly gentleman. He had been monitoring our politics for 40, 50 years. And he came to me, and you know what he asked me? He said, Rudy, how did they do it? I said, what do you mean, how did they do it? He said, how did they do it? I said, how do you do it? What do you mean? He said, how did that government destroy your country in such a short period of time? How did they do it? When you come to this country today, if you were here 10, 20 years ago, I imagine. And in great respect, even when uh, Mr. Manning was prime minister, you know, he had some type of vision. And where if you came to this country 10, 20 years ago, it is unrecognizable today. If you land at Piaco, or you come, well, you know, you come to report, but if you land at Piaco, it is unrecognizable. And it, it, has, it, has, it has disappeared. And now the minister comes this year with the same broken promises. Every single year, you know, it's the same thing. The port scanners, we announced today, they beat the table. Port scanners. You know those port scanners are being procured about five years now? And when the head of customs came, the head of customs came to the Joint Select Committee on National Security, we asked her. He said, Madam, why is this taking so long? Something like scanners. You could purchase those things now easily. This is not 1925. You could purchase easily. She said, she wanted to tell the committee that they were purchasing the scanners. And then they got an instruction from the Ministry of Finance that they cannot use what is called sole selective. They have to go through Central Tenders Board. Now that's very instructive. When they're buying ship and boat, they don't go through Central uh, Tenders Board. When they're buying equipment for the Strategic um, Intelligence Agency, they don't go through Central Tenders Board. When they're buying aeroplane, they don't go through Central Tenders Board. But when you have to buy scanners, you go through Central Tenders Board. So it takes two, three years plus to get scanners installed. It takes years to get scanners installed. And one wonders whether or not that is deliberate. Because these things you can buy, they're like dialysis machines and so on. You can just buy 10, 20 and scatter them. You can buy that. And these are years, Madam Speaker, in closing, I know I'll have a couple minutes left. But in closing, I will say that today, I also want to give hope to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. That as far as bad as it appears, the United National Congress is standing strong and standing our ground. And we have the personnel, we certainly have the support in the aftermath of the local government. We have the support, we have the personnel, we have the ideas. In fact, one thing you cannot say about the UNC and the member for Siparia, you cannot say that we don't have plans and policy. In fact, I was nicely surprised the next day after Siparia talk, the headline was, Kamla outlined 27 point plan. As if you need, you know, you needed to see that. 27 point. You can give us five point. And Madam Speaker, we have the plans, we have the policies, we have the programs. Some we introduced already. We'll have to restart those programs to deal with specifically with crime and the importation of illegal firearms and so on. We have the program, we have the personnel. We can mobilize this country. So I tell members of the national community, as dumb as you feel, as weak as you feel, as uh, you may be in despair, you may be depressed, you may be sending me a message about this country collapsed and gone through. Please, we cannot accept that. We must save our country. And Madam Speaker, 
I want to put it to you that for us to grow, they must go. I want to thank you for your attention.